I would like to describe a field in which little has been done, but in which an enormous amount can be done. This field is not quite the same as the others in that it will tell us little of fundamental physics, but it will tell us much about the strange phenomena that occur just below our perception. In contrast to the natural philosophers of the past, the scientists of this field delve into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. Their quest is to understand and create the imperceptible. After all, there is plenty of room at the bottom. Hello and welcome to the Materialism Podcast, an exploration of the past, present, and future of material science. I'm your co-host, Taylor Sparks. I'm an associate professor of material science and engineering at the University of Utah, and I am not joined today by my trusty co-host, Andrew, who's got some family stuff he's doing, but today I do have a really cool episode for you. Give it a listen. Do you know what that is? You've heard it before. How about this? Recognize it? (laughs) One more. How about this? That's right. On today's episode, we will be talking about that ubiquitous material, even more so than steel, perhaps. It is absolutely all around us. Since the time that you were a tiny child to now in college and beyond, you have used paper. Paper is absolutely all around us. We sort of take it for granted. In today's conversation with the CEO of James Cropper, a manufacturer in the paper space, we're going to learn about what paper is and what it could be. Some of the cool imaginations of what we could make paper become for the tech sector, for the sustainability sector, and for a lot more. So stay tuned for this interview with Phil Wild. All right, today we are joined by Phil Wild, the CEO at James Cropper. Uh, Phil, I'm going to ask you to tell a little bit about yourself, but I'll do a quick introduction. Uh, I noticed that you've been at James Cropper for, for just about 10 years now, and prior to that, you did 20 years at 3M, um, and your education has been in business. So most of the folks we chat to are material scientists, but we're excited to talk to somebody who really brings business chops and an understanding of how the business world works when you go to try and uh, commercialize these material science innovations. So Phil, why don't you tell us about yourself? Well, uh, first of all, good morning, Taylor, or actually good afternoon, because uh, <laughs> I'm sat here in uh, in England at uh, at the moment. Um, so yeah, I, you've just done a, a great introduction on me. I'm not sure I need to add anything else uh, else to that. To to be honest, I think uh, probably just expanding a little bit. I I, I am an engineer, um, so my uh, original education was in uh, manufacturing engineering. Ah, oh, okay. Um, and uh, I spent uh, I spent the first part of my career in in automotive in in engineering. It, it probably took me uh, about three years to realise I was a really bad engineer, <laughs> and uh, and I, I moved into uh, yeah, supervision and management, and I, I I kind of got the bug for uh, for business. So uh, pretty much most most of my career I've been uh, I've been running businesses to greater or, or fun, but in in all circumstances I've been part of a manufacturing organisation. Um, so I, I've been in uh, yeah, uh, sexy products like sandpaper and masking tape, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but also yeah, I've been in uh, aerospace and uh, and pharmaceutical and security, and then more lately at, uh, at James Cropper, um, which you know, has its heritage in in the paper business. But now you know we're a material science business. So, uh, and I think <clears throat> to be an effective business leader uh, in a manufacturing environment, you know, to have an engineering background or a chemistry background or a science-based background is uh, uh, is an uh, I would say uh, a, a, an important advantage it's probably an essential advantage yeah. to uh, you know to really you know perform in that role and, and work with the team around you you know I've seen people like you that come from a technical side and move towards the business side and then work in a technical space, but I almost never see the opposite. It's so much more, I think, possible when you have that foundation of the fundamentals of how technology works and what it can and can't do to then think about applications for it and how to commercialize it. And I think it's tough to go the other way. So I I apologize for missing that. I didn't realize the uh, manufacturing degree training. Anyways, we are delighted to have you on the show today. Um, I'm excited to talk to Phil because he is very close to where I'm going to be for the next year. I will actually be in Liverpool on a sabbatical for the next year, and he's up in the Lake District, which is definitely on my list of places to come and visit. So uh, tell us about where you're at and what do you guys do? So, uh, Taylor, when you're over, you'll be an hour's drive away from uh, from the Lake District, uh, a World Heritage Site, I hasten to add. Um, I, I'd ask you to uh, to bring your waterproofs and your and your and your woolly hat at the same time. Doesn't matter if it's uh, summer, winter, spring. Bring them anyway. Um, uh, but yeah, you know, we'll we'll welcome to see you there. 
Um, so uh, James Copper is a really unique business. Uh, it's been around for, um, we describe ourselves as a business with heritage, uh, as opposed to an old business. But uh -huh. we've been around for over, over 250 years. Uh, so this year we celebrate, gosh, 177 years under wow. proper ownership. Um, now we are we are a listed business, but predominantly it's uh, it's family owned, uh, and we have a uh, sixth generation cropper who's the uh, who's the chair of our business. Um, but the business actually goes back previous uh, to uh, to the cropper ownership, and uh, you know it's uh, it sits on a uh, on on the uh, on the River Kent, um, and it was uh, it was it was a mill that was uh, that was has always used the water from uh, from the river either either for a source of power or for a source of raw material. We still use it today as a source of, uh, source of raw material. Uh, so we started off as a, uh, as a farming mill, uh, making, uh, making sickles. Um, oh, yeah, the, uh, the blade that we uh, uh -huh. would use to be able to, to cut the, uh, cut, I'm, I'm now going back 250 years, by the way. Um, and then it developed to, uh, it, to, to grinding crops. It then developed to a, uh, using the power of the, of the water to, for, to, for a fabric mill. Um, and then uh, about 180, 190 years ago, it started manufacturing paper. In fact, it's, it's, uh, it was one of the uh, first uh, paper manufacturers in, uh, in this part of the world. Obviously, paper has been going for, for uh, almost, almost millennia. Um, but um, in terms of the, you know, using, the, using cellulose fabrics or cellulose uh, materials in order to, uh, to produce paper. So, uh, so who are we today? Um, today we have uh, we have three businesses. We have a paper business, which yeah, I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, a a colour form business, which is uh, um, moulded fibre uh, made from uh, recycled uh, or uh, reusable materials, um, and a technical fibre business, uh, which is the materials that typically we use in uh, for the manufacture of composites and uh, quite often uh, the materials we use there are things like carbon fiber so we're a, we're a materials business we're a material science business you know we're a medium sized organization uh, we're about uh, 650 strong we've got uh, four different manufacturing sites uh, in the UK and and in the US as uh, as well uh, where i was uh, just a couple of weeks ago um, and uh, we're about a hundred and listen dollars, about one hundred and fifty million dollar turnover to to put it in perspective. So we're a medium sized organization, great heritage, uh, but very very forward thinking as uh, as well. Yeah, to stick around for two hundred years and to move from just paper to sort of the packaging space and now to technical, you know, fabrics. You have to be forward thinking. <laughs> you can't be stagnant, or you're going to get left behind. Well. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, I'm excited to learn about all three of those. Maybe let's talk about paper first. Um, I think sort of we take for granted paper. It's just always been there since we're little kids, since your very first drawings, paper is just all, it's ubiquitous. It's absolutely all around us. And I think sometimes we forget that somebody has to make this stuff and not just make it, but we can engineer it to make the best possible version of paper. So tell us about some of the advent and the history of paper manufacturing and in particular places, things that you've done to make it uh, an exceptional version of paper. So paper has many, many, many different uh, different uses, and, <clears throat> and as you as you say, it's been around for for, uh, for many years. Um, we're a bespoke paper manufacturer, so we we, we manufacture coloured paper, we texture paper, we coat paper, um, and uh, a, a typical paper manufacturer around the world will make very, very high quantities and, and low variety. So it's the sort of paper you'd be using for your stationery that we're going through to your, to your photocopy machine and, uh, and so on. We're totally the opposite to that. We are, we're a small manufacturer, um, but we, we manufacture a very wide variety of, uh, of products. So, so we would describe ourselves as, as bespoke. Let me give you, uh, give you some examples. Uh, well, one of the areas that we, that we focus on is the uh, luxury packaging business. Um, and so today we, we're manufacturing materials to, for people like uh, Burberry, uh, Tiffany, uh, Louis Vuitton, Chanel, uh, those sorts of organizations. So we're not making boxes or, or bags. We're making the materials that are used to produce boxes and, uh, and bags and, and, and packaging in, in that area. But if you take, 
let's just take a, a Burberry as, a, as an example. Um, to produce a product for a, for a luxury uh, brand like Burberry, um, it's, it's, about, it's about color, it's about aesthetics, um, it's about finish, it's about functionality, and it's also um, the authenticity of the product as, uh, as well. Uh, how sustainable it is, where, where the source is going. So, so let, me, let me talk about that in, in, in a little bit more detail. And let's take a sort of prime, you know, first place, let's just take the colour. So you, uh, you, you, I, you maybe go wherever you go shopping, but if you, if you went shopping in, in Burberry and you take a Burberry bag, you say, well, it's brown. Well, it's not brown. It's a particular shade of brown and it needs to be the same colour, time in, time out. It's the, it's the brand bespoke shade that's uh, that's produced and that takes uh, a lot of chemistry so we have we have the world's best chemists on on color uh, and we use uh, we use mineral dyes to make sure it's sustainable and uh, biodegradable but, but, the, but the quality is right and I, I, I always use an example of um, uh, of, a, of a distillery of a, of a whiskey distillery okay uh, that where a, a taster, so we call them a master taster in uh, in a distillery. Distillery will be will be we're taking a taste of the uh, of, of the whiskey through the various uh, various stages and making a judgment on it. There's a lot of scientific equipment involved, um, and it's the same with us. So we would have um, a lot of uh, optical equipment in order to be able to measure measure color we do it under different light sources so we can see it in, under shop light uh you know, whether it's halogen we see it under led we see it under sunlight and, and the light and the, and the color can vary so we do all those measurements but we also have some of the world's expert that will just look at the product and they'll say it's too blue it's too blue <laughs> it's too red, it's too red. And, I'm, and i'm looking at the product thinking it kind of looks white to me <laughs> like, no 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 it's way too green i think surely there's no green in there and then, do you know what? They're right every time. Um, so a lot of craft involved in doing it, as well as 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 well as technology. And then, uh, so once we have crafted the color and crafted the chemistry to go in the color, then that's that's produced for the for the brand. But then we will also create a texture. So when you look at a, you know, when you're picking a, a, a packaging product, up, quite often you'll find that the uh, the packaging is in text is embossed. Um, and, and quite often we'll do a unique emboss as, as well. So a, another good example is, is Burberry, but um, the, the emboss on there is a fabric emboss. Uh, so it, it's there to, to uh, give the image of a, of a fabric pod, product like the, like a very classic trench coat that you'd, uh, that you'd produce on there as well. So you kind of look closely at it and it, and it looks nice. Oh, it's, it's covered in fabric, it's actually covered in, uh, it's actually covered in paper. Um, to give you another couple of examples, uh, we produce when we produce some colours, it can attract uh, some of the grease from your fingers or, or dust and, and so on. So we also we coat the product with a, a sustainable coating that can be recycled uh, afterwards, but it prevents any contamination of the paper. Any you know, when you're handling the product, it still looks pristine and, and new. And, and Taylor, that's just the looks of the of the product, and that's not even to talk about functionality. Because, you know, we, we also manufacture, um, uh, you, know, you know, the red poppy um, that's used on, on Remembrance Day. Uh, it's a product that's uh, it's, uh, synonymous for, on the 11th of November in the, in the UK okay. when we, uh, com you know, we uh, commemorate uh, those who died in the war. Um, but, uh, but you can also take, you know, other materials, like a, take a shopping bag that's made out of yellow. So you can imagine... Uh, take a typical day, and you'll find out when you're in Liverpool. You'll take a typical day in the Lake District when it's tipping it down with rain, <laughs> and, and you and 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 and, and Taylor's walking with his white jeans, and you've got a nice yellow shopping bag. You can't afford for the for the dye to run out of the shopping bag, and you and it come out on your uh, on, on on your clothes and so on. So it's what we call dye fast, um, and that's part of the uh, the functionality. So. By the time that the product is finished, you know that you cannot get the colour out of uh, out of that product. It won't come out under under normal circumstances. Also, you know, if the something goes into a shopping bag, um, it's got to carry all the different weights, and we do that with the science of uh, using the right type of fibre. Right. Um, so we use we use products like uh, like birch, like pine, 
like eucalyptus. And each has its own characteristics. Uh, generally, the, the longer the fiber, the stronger the product, because it, it, it provides a, sure, a more entangling. opportunity yeah. to, to link. Absolutely. The shorter the fiber, the better surface finish. So whereas ah. the products look identical, uh, if you put a product on a box, you'll go for surface finish because you don't need a strength in a box because it, it, it sits around a, sure. uh, a, a gray card uh, inner. Uh, whereas a bag is is purely paper and, you know, whatever, whether shoes are going in it or, or an Xbox goes in it or whatever, whatever goes in, it needs to take the weight. And what you'll find in a, in a bag is is quite a long fiber. So you, you, you're tailoring your materials in order to create the right quality of product that uh, that comes through as well. So, so you're absolutely right. I, you know, you say, well, we take paper for granted. There is an enormous science that goes into uh, into paper. In order to create the finished uh, the finished product. So, gosh, I have so many questions from this. Uh, one is, how often do you find yourself constrained by manufacturing technique and capability? Because we know from a material standpoint exactly what microstructure leads to what properties, and you could imagine, oh, great, if we can just get the fibers aligned in such a way, we would have these properties. But to actually make that and to make that at scale and to do that uh, with actual you know machinery, is that a common limiting factor, or is it not? Um, I, I, I guess when you've been doing it for 200 years, it's probably it's probably not that new. Um, but it's uh, there's a lot of intellectual property that goes into into manufacturing paper, particularly particularly bespoke paper and particularly colour paper. Um, you know, it's uh, the, the the tricky part is not just the manufacturing; it's swapping and changing, uh, mm. and that's probably the limiting uh, one of the limiting factors. So, for example. You know, we never stop our manufacturing process. So if you're manufacturing uh, a product uh, and you're going from one color to another, we normally go from a light color to a, to a dark color. And when you're manufacturing something that's yellow and you go on to, and you go on to red, you've got a period of time yep. that you're making a product yep. that's orange. Yep. Um, uh, and, that's and, and therefore you, you create an engineering solution that allows you to, to change between one and the other as quickly as possible. So your, your period of contamination of two products is to an absolute minimum. Now, as it happens, we will then take that out and then we'll put it back into our raw materials supply and then we'll, we'll, we will sure. use that again. Sure. Um, but obviously you don't want to be putting things through your process more than, uh, more than once on, uh, on often occasions. Okay. Well, one thing I like about what you're describing is that you're, you're, you're describing a world in which we can have these luxury goods, but we don't have to sort of sacrifice sustainability that you're finding and you're providing the solution where you can have luxury goods and high quality stuff, but also make sure that they're being done responsibly. Um, tell me more about that. Like what, what initiatives you have to make sure that you can make things that are sustainable? Because as you're describing paper and you're talking about coatings and protective things, I'm, I'm immediately thinking of the fact that how, how on earth are you going to recycle this, for example, right? When you start mixing polymers and paper together, it drastically changes the way that we recycle typical paper. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think it probably falls under a, a few different categories. So we can talk about <clears throat> um, how we make things today, uh, some, some of the areas that we've changed and also the way that we're looking forward as well. Um, so one of the areas I'll talk about is, is mono materials. And that in, in our industry is, uh, is a key area because as soon as you, st as you start uh, combining and contaminating a product, you're moving away from, from mono materials and then the ability to then recycle afterwards is, is a, lot, uh, a lot more difficult. So, so whereas <clears throat> we do talk about colors and coatings, uh, not that they're, they're all uh, natural based, they're all, they're all mineral based. So for example, some of the coatings that we have is actually potato starch really? um, that just gives that just gives a, uh, a you know, a starch would give a, a clear protective coating, but again, it, it's cellulose based, it's recyclable, it's compostable, it's recyclable. So as soon as we start, for example, if we were to laminate um, paper with, uh, with a polymer, uh, you know, irrespective of it coming from a sustainable source, it, it will not be recycled afterwards. It, it's, uh, and you've moved away from that, that mono material. Um, <clears throat> but moreover, um, one of the areas that we've moved into is how do we not use virgin fiber all the time? So, um, and, you know, despite the um, cellulose, which, which, which are trees, um, is, a, is, a, uh, is a sustainable product, and just, just for information, um, you know, we would only buy materials from what we call FSC source, PFSC source. Um, and I, I describe that as a, as a giant 
farmer's field um, because it, it's a crop. And for every one tree that we use, three trees are then planted to, uh, to yep. replace. And a tree is never used for one source. Um, so when, it, when, a, when, a tree, uh, when a tree comes down uh, for farming, the bottom of the tree is used for, for construction. Uh, the middle of the tree is, uh, is used for uh, furniture manufacture. And the top of the tree, which is all the spindly branches and so on, that's used for paper manufacture. Um, and uh, anyway, so, uh, but where we've also moved to is actually how can we continue to make ourselves more independent from using virgin fiber that, uh, that comes in? So uh, we started to look at waste sources. And one of the waste sources that we, uh, that we found was, was coffee cups. So I'm talking oh, yeah. uh, you know, like a Starbucks takeaway coffee cup. Now, that's a, that's a really good example of something that's not a mono material. So it's a, it's a fiber on the outside. It's, it's printed. It's got quite a lot of filler in it, like clay. Um, and then it's got a laminated plastic on the inside, clearly to protect coffee from spilling over and, and, uh, and, and waterproofing the, the product. But, so we developed a process that takes out the uh, plastic liner from, from the inside, uh, removes some of the materials, which typically are minerals anyway, so mineral dyes uh, and clay and so on, and it leaves us with the fiber. So today we're using half a billion used coffee cups. Um, so from people, like, uh, from people like Costa Coffee, from people like Starbucks, from, from McDonald's, um, and we are removing the polymer on, for, to become a second life. Now we don't do that. We provide that to another party, but that becomes it becomes carpets. It becomes uh, insulation wire, uh, insulation material for for wires. Um, the uh, the the minerals that come off we use for other things, things like animal bedding and so on. And we we reuse the fibers, and that fiber then gets put back into our our supply chain. So um, so the the a lot of the materials we use today they look. Um, look pristine, uh, uh, but actually, most of them are probably made out of at least fifty percent used coffee cups. God, that's um, cool. And so it helps us to sort of re recycle them, uh, recycle them back through. How challenging is it then when you, you know your primary source for these different? I guess you call it secondary source for coffee cups, whatever it is. When they change, right? When Starbucks changes the formulation for their cups or whatever else, right? How robust does your process need to be to be? Uh, do you have to tune it in real time to the changing composition of your input? You know, recycled material or what? Yeah, we are. <clears throat> it's a great question. Um, we're quite discerning of the waste sources that mm -hmm. we use, so we will know. Um, a brand's how a brand's uh, cup is made. So, just as an example, um, McDonald's. Um, if you if you take a coffee in McDonald's, quite often at, on the outside of the cup, they'll give you an extra uh, liner to be able to hold your cup. So, it, it, like, yep. like an insulation. Now, the challenge we had is the liner that they used was uh, was from a what we call a recycled mechanical uh, waste. And what we mean by that is actually everything goes into the machine. Paper goes in, plastic goes in, uh, paint goes in, bits of metal go in. And, and what you end up with is, is a, almost like a composite piece of material. Yep. Now, the problem that we had was it, we found it very difficult to mechanically separate the two. <laughs> um, and therefore, you know, we couldn't really use the product. So we had a, and what happened then is all the waste from the McDonald's coffee cups then had to go to landfill. Because there was no, it, it was either incinerated or, or landfill, and mostly it, it was landfill because it couldn't be reused. So we had a we had a discussion with uh, with McDonald's, and they changed the outer uh, insulation material to uh, to a, a pure form of uh, paper. Now it doesn't matter if it was recycled or, or pure, but it was a pure form. And for them, it cost them more money to to do that. However, what they were doing is they were paying for landfill. Yep. Um, and so now that we're taking the product and not paying for landfill, which more than compensated for them to change the material, and then we can then recycle the material back through on uh, in terms of our, our process. So, so yeah, it's, it's an excellent point. We are discerning. It has to be the right sorts of material. Uh, we are typically in line with uh, with the you know manufacturers of coffee cups. You know, the likes of Starbucks and McDonald's don't manufacture their own cups. We we work with the sure. manufacturers who, who do that. So we know we know the materials that go into it.
Well, that's fantastic. Uh, I teach courses on sustainability here at the University of Utah. One of the things we talk about is design with the end of life in mind. And I think for the longest time in, in not just materials, but in manufacturing in general, it was just about getting the best product to the consumer. You wanted the best performance and that was really what you wanted. And it's oftentimes, I think the case that you do have to take a slight uh, reduction in performance, but to have it be uh, recyclable, right? So you can have a sustainable product. For example, you might put the, uh, if you think of like rare earth magnets, right? Rare earth magnets are absolutely all over the place, but they're so embedded in the technology that you use, it's very hard to actually recover those. It's, and then you can't smelt those and, re and capture them. Um, so you actually have to design that product in a way that you can actually recover that afterwards. Uh, we are very far from doing that as a field. Uh, we're not even close, but at least that the conversation has started is I think important. And it's exciting to see case studies like what you've just described, where it's not only feasible, you can provide a great product, but you don't have to take a, a big hit because you're thinking about the cost of the landfill versus actually providing this to a recycler. So I love that. I love to see that example of design with end of life in mind. Uh, and the term that we put on this is upcycling, not recycling. Yep. Because and what we expect is the end of that. What's something that was going to landfill, we're now putting back into our product with a yep. view that can be recycled again. Yeah, absolutely. Well, phenomenal. Um, tell me more about, we, we sort of chatted about this custom paper, this high-end uh, bespoke, I think you called it, sort of boutique, <laughs> you know, high-quality paper. Tell me now about the paper molding uh, and what you're doing there. Well, you know, I, a comment that you made earlier is you, you can't be around for more than 200 years and, and not be driving uh, change and, and, and innovation. And uh, or I described it as forward thinking. And that's true. You, you, you know, uh, to be a long term business, uh, you can't be me too. You know, we have to be reinventing and developing new, new products and technologies. Uh, and I describe ourselves as very medium to long term thinking, not short term thinking. Um, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples. So as part of that, I'll answer your question on, uh, on the packaging product as well. But we established a, uh, a, a team within our, our, our organization called Technology and Innovation. And, and that team was 100% uh, focused on, on looking at uh, you know, new technologies, new materials, new developments that are coming out. Because what we found is Whereas we had R&D teams in each one of our, our businesses, our R&D teams were quite well absorbed of dealing with customer issues. Like there was a complaint, so we had to like, or, or, or maybe there was a supplier change in the materials or the developing material. So quite you know, short to medium term thinking. Uh, you know, and, and what we were lacking is the long term thinking and innovation yep. and, uh, and technology. And that's why we created this uh, this team. And you know, I, I mean, what a what a dream team to be in because you know you don't have the phone ringing with uh, customers and suppliers, and you can really focus on some fundamental uh, changes in uh, in technology that are happening. And uh, I set the team a uh, a challenge uh, some years ago, and I said I I want a third leg of our business, uh, but you know I want I want to understand some some global mega trends and be focused on some global global mega trends but i want to do something that we kind of know uh, know something about already and what the team developed was was color form so you can imagine something like um a, a molded fiber egg box for example so that that will be a, a great but on steroids um so we we do a lot of work on on design and color and texture but essentially we're making a package that's manufactured out of out of paper in in any color, uh, and so today you know we're producing for uh, companies like L'Oreal, Diesel, Armani, Moe Hennessy, uh, whiskey brands, other champagne brands, and we're producing that their their outer packaging and inner packaging as uh, as well, and it's an alternative to to things like uh, uh, plastic packaging. It's an alternative to boxes. Uh, and quite often what you'll find with boxes, boxes are not mono material. Uh, there's quite often a plastic on the outside. It's a cut, it's a gray inner and they've got magnets in there and they've got plastic inserts in there. And we're creating mono materials that, that sit around the, uh, the package itself. But not only are we doing that, but we're leveraging our 200 plus years of chemistry on, on color in, in our paper business. And we're applying that to color form. So we can, we can make, uh, molded fiber packaging in any color and consistent color each time. So, you know, work that we do for 
diesel on our money you know it goes in black and it goes in blue and it goes in, in red to be able to uh, to be able to meet the, the brand and and the reason that we moved into that is because we recognized you know a, a global mega trend moving away from uh from plastics to to sustainable materials um but we also recognized that um you know it, it's a topic that we knew something about already uh, oh, yeah. in terms of you know, we, we have fibers and and, and, and colors uh, and so on but it also matched with our values as as an organization uh to you know both being forward thinking but also driving a sustainable future as part of the product portfolio so in the end it sounds like it's not only a better product but a recyclable one um are there other advantages of this as opposed to say molded polystyrene or anything else what, what about well, cost, for example, um, or what about uh, the types of shapes that you could produce or the structural in integrity of the final? Yeah, I think I, I, I think the, the couple of key areas there. Um, I, quite often, it's a point of sale product. Uh, so the product is, uh, you know, whether it's, say it's a perfume, for example. Okay. Um, and, uh, and our color form is, is the outer packaging of the perfume. Um, so from a uh, so it has to have a brand appeal so color is is really important which you, you certainly can't get on you mentioned polystyrene but you, you, you know you certainly can't get that with a whole series of that um also um it's very clear that it's uh, that it's paper uh, so from a consumer a, a hmm. discerning consumer you will be making purchasing decisions based on actually the authenticity uh of of, of a product you know where we talk about you know, recyclable and, and, and sustainable products. If something is uh, is packaged in paper, then clearly it can be recycled and cost compostable. It's from a sustainable, so unlike uh, unlike plastics. But the design capability is is unique. So a little bit like, like in paper, where we'd emboss, we're molding and we're molding intricate shapes. Um, you know, so we can put you know we can put text on there. We can put unique shapes. The the product that we produced recently for Moet Hennessy. Is, a, is an outer packaging for a, for a champagne bottle, it's Runard. And, and the design that we put on the outside is uh, it's a, a, we took a digital image uh, from the inside of the, of the wine cellars in, uh, oh, cool. in the Champagne region in France. So we took a 3D image and then we created our mold with the 3D image of the, um, uh, of, of the wine cellars as part of that area. So actually the bottle, is the inside of that wine cellar and it's you know you can provide totally unique and bespoke shapes to to be able to do and obviously for other brands we're doing we're doing different and unique things as well oh that's really cool okay all right so we've chatted about paper we've chatted about this uh the structural paper for box for packaging essentially uh and then the thing that is most similar to maybe what i've worked in in the past is the work that you've done in these sort of high technology carbon fiber and other you know technical fabrics uh can you talk a little bit about that sure so i if i talk very briefly we rewind back 35 oh, please. 40 years carbon carbon fiber is, was a, a new material so today we might talk about i don't know, say graphene is a relatively new material uh, then it was it, it was carbon fiber now carbon fiber is uh it, it's a fibrous material we were using cellulose fiber at the time so taking on the spirit of uh, of innovation we had a team at the time said hey we found this new material it's carbon fiber we've chopped it up uh, and so we've got small strands of fiber we want to run it down one of the paper lines and just see what it does uh, so they ran it down. They made they made an entire mess of the of the line, <laughs> contaminated all the line. I'm sure it was down for for, for many months. But they manufactured non woven material, and and they realised it didn't naturally bind. So like uh, like a cellulose product will has starches in it, and it naturally binds together. I found that the <clears throat> the carbon fibre didn't. Yeah. So they had to add a, a resin in there. Um, so various trials, and and they ended up with a. A fabric, you know, a piece of non-woven fabric that was made out of carbon fiber, super, super, super lightweight. Oh yeah. Uh, and then they worked with a series of universities around the world to uh, to determine. Oh, so, so what does it do? And and the feedback was was quite phenomenal. And you know, the the feedback from the universities at the time said, "Hey, this product has got some outstanding uh, qualities to it. Did you know that you know it's uh, it's highly conductive." Uh, so you've, you've now got a fabric that is super, well, that's no, it's super conductive, super conductive at the time, back in 20, 30, 35 to 40 years ago. Um, but actually, this could be used for static dissipation. 
yep. it's, it's exceptionally light. Um, and did you know that it's also got um, shielding properties? So when we've, uh, uh, when we've wrapped this around a product, it, it prevents um, electromagnetic radiation. So it's act, it acts like a Faraday cage. So it's acting like a solid metal. And yet, you know, it, it's uh, it's kind of a fiftieth of the of the weight of a uh, of a solid metal. So, so that's that's actually how it originated. It comes back to the sort of the spirit of innovation of trying things out and seeing what works and, and what didn't. And and today, <clears throat> we've got a uh, trying to do this in dollars as well. Uh, a, a fifty million dollar business um, in our uh, in our technical fiber uh, products. So we we now have. Um, lines that are dedicated to manufacturing materials uh, of using this, so we, we, we they, they're not contaminating the paper lines any uh, anymore. Sure. Um, and it gets used on a, on a whole series of different things. So, for example, uh, every Boeing and every Airbus around the world has our materials on it, and it's used for um, it's used for a, a protection uh, around. So, uh, most uh, uh, most aircraft today are manufactured out of out of carbon fiber. It's very strong. It's very light. It stays up in the air for for long uh, for longer, so it doesn't have to come down and refuel as often. Um, but it's not protecting the inside from electromagnetic radiation for, that's being created from the from the engines on on either wing. Um, so our material is used as a as a shield, and it protects uh, the very sensitive electronics that go from the cockpit down to the, down to the tail from any electromagnetic interference that's coming through. It also uh, provides lightning strike uh, properties as well. So when an aeroplane goes through, uh, through a storm and, and, it's, and it is hit by lightning, the lightning hits the aircraft, it goes around the aircraft and down throughout, and it clearly if it went through, it's gonna cause some, somewhat of a challenge. Um, and, and also it's providing static dissipation. So as the aircraft is flying through, uh, again, through clouds and, it, and it, you know, the, the electrons are, are, are being hit and it creates static, um, then what it's a, the, our material provides is static dissipation through, uh, through the body and then helps to, uh, helps to release that. So, so uh, aerospace is a, uh, is a key area for us. Um, and then more recently, we've moved into what I would call green energy. Um, so our material is used for things like wind turbine blades. Mm -hmm. uh, so wind turbine blades are, uh, uh, are clearly uber light, uh, but strong. Um, and our material is used as a, as a material that sits on the, on the outside of a blade. And again, it's used for things like lightning strike. Um, it's also used for, uh, for static as, uh, as well. Um, but also when we've moved into the hydrogen space uh, and the material that is used for the gas diffusion layer yeah, on the this inside I'm familiar of with. a... <laughs> so pen uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of yep. hydrogen. Um, and our material is used in 50% of the world's hydrogen fuel cells. Um, so everything from static fuel cells to fuel cells that are used for, uh, used for transportation. And it's used as part of that whole body of, uh, of the gas diffusion. I mean, it's, it's the fundamental chemistry and physics part within the, within the gas diffusion layer. Um, and then we've, uh, we've actually made an acquisition recently that is for uh, coatings that are used for electrodes for, to be able to produce um, uh, the hydrogen material as well. Again, you know, I'm talking about green hydrogen here in terms of uh, yeah, yeah. The, uh, you know, the PEM process. Well, I, I'm curious about that last point. You said you acquired a company. This is to functionalize this, right? So you add the carbon fiber layer for the gas diffusion layer, but now you're actually functionalizing it with catalysts, I assume, so that you can actually make the process happen a little bit faster. Fantastic. So what we're trying to do is position ourselves through the supply chain. So the, the, the coatings and the, and the catalysts are used for the manufacture of hydrogen on one side, which is uh, an acquisition that we made uh, quite recently. So we're, we're, we're essentially coating uh, uh, sintered titanium with, uh -huh. uh, with the materials like platinum, which would be act as a, as, yep. a, as a catalyst. And then on the other side of the supply chain, it's where the hydrogen is then used, particularly in transportation, whether it's things like for the trucks, whether it's heavy goods vehicles, whether it's marine or, uh, or automotive, it's actually used in the fuel cell itself that's then utilizing the hydrogen as, a, uh, as an energy source. Yeah. Phenomenal. Well, it sounds like I was just going to ask you, if, you know, what's, what's on the horizon? You've talked about this very 
uh, legacy or historical, you know, company that took, you know, paper that's been around for thousands and thousands of years and has reimagined it in several interesting ways. And I was going to ask what's next, but you sort of already described it. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about? Like what's coming down the line, what paper could be in new ways that we could reimagine it? So, you know, we're constantly innovating uh, and I, I, I'll give you just a couple of couple of snippets of things that we're looking at. Uh, one is that we we're also looking at so where has we been using coffee cup in paper? What else, what else can we use? Uh, and some of the experiments that we're doing at the moment is on used clothing. Um, oh, cool. There's too, there's too much clothing that's going, there's too much clothing in the world. Um, and um, in fact, there's enough clothing at the moment to be able to clothe six generations of, of, of the wow. world. Yeah. Um, and, and what we're looking at is how do then we, uh, be able to to look at cotton clothing and bring back the cellulose from the cotton clothing and then recycle that back so we're looking at techniques of uh you know how to how to remove the synthetic stitching how to remove buttons how to remove zips and then how to how to then extract the cotton to to come back into our products that's for, for us that's now work in progress operationally we're looking at how to we to we totally decarbonize so we've uh, we've challenged ourselves to be carbon neutral by uh, by 2030. Uh, paper is uh, is quite an energy intensive business, and uh, today we already have three solar farms uh, that are owned by the community that we uh, that we buy the the energy from. The profits then go back into the community, and that's part of our ESG uh, work that we're uh, that we're doing. Um, but then we've also got to change some of our technology on site in order to both reduce our energy consumption and then switch it away from uh, from a fossil fuel to a recycle. So so a couple of uh, just a couple of snippets of things that we've got ahead uh, amongst some others that I probably can't tell you about just yet. Cool. Looking very forward to learning about them. Uh, Phil, this was a pleasure as a really fun conversation. It's fascinating to learn about what you guys do and we'll be in touch. Fantastic. Great to speak okay. to you. Talk to you later. Okay, special thanks to our sponsors of the show. We are sponsored by Elsevier's journal Materials Today. This is an excellent journal. It's one that you should definitely be aware of. If you've published in this space, I hope that you'll consider reaching out to Materials Today. It's an excellent publisher, but they do more than their journal. While that's an excellent journal and we read it a lot, in fact, you've seen a lot of the episodes that we discuss, we use articles from that journal, but you'll also notice that they're much more than that. Elsevier's really created a large community of researchers. They have events, they have conferences, they have a lot there. One particular event I wanna point out for today's episode is the upcoming conference in Genoa, Italy in October. Not too shabby, I will be there. Hope that you'll come too. It is called the seventh international conference on multifunctional hybrid and nanomaterials. I'll be there talking about the podcast, but also giving a talk on some of the composite materials that we work on in our lab for electronic uh, and ionic conductors. So hope to see you there. That'll be in Genoa, Italy, October 19th. Uh, to the 22nd. Um, by the way, if you want to learn more, you can check out the hashtag, hashtag HYMA for hybrid materials, HYMA 2022, or you can Google the, uh, you can find it on their Elsevier.com's website under the events section. Okay, special thanks to everyone else that made this show possible. As always, we like to appreciate the people that make the music for the show, Alphabot and Colobite. You can find them on Bandcamp and Spotify and elsewhere. They make awesome music. We appreciate what they did to help make it available for this show. We also want to hear from you. Today's episode with uh, Phil Wild, the CEO of James Cropper, that was suggested by a listener, right? If you have cool suggestions for other great people that we should talk to or technologies that we should discover or talk about, you know, let us know. You can send us an email. That's materialism.podcast at gmail.com. Or you can contact us on our socials. We're most active on Instagram. So at materialismpodcast on Instagram, um, but also on Twitter and elsewhere. Anyways, we love to hear from you. If you haven't given us a review, Pretty please, we would love it. And we will see you soon. Until next time. The inventors of fire, electricity, magnetism, iron, lead, glass, silk, cotton. The makers of tools, the captors of lightning, the architect, the engineer, the musician, are all beneficiaries of the materials of this world and are bound only by their imaginations in manipulating those materials.